In 1841, Britain became smaller. The journey from London to Bristol was reduced from two days to just five hours. Thanks to this, the Great Western Railway. A feat of engineering acknowledged by many as Isambard Kingdom Brunel's finest achievement. I do get this great sense of, of pride and a weird kind of connection. It starts as you arrive at Paddington, you come into this wonderful cathedral-like space and you get on the train and it slowly pulls off. The first major obstacle is the Brent Valley. And so to cross that valley, uh, Brunel designed one of his most magnificent structures, which was the Warncliffe Viaduct. And you go across the Maidenhead Bridge. When you're on the train, you have no idea how beautiful that structure is. The river commissioners insisted that ships should be able to go underneath um, the, the bridge. So he created these two uh, graceful 128-foot arches across the River Thames. The whole journey is to be like a journey to a paradise. The dream of the English picturesque. Before you get to Bath, you go through the wonderful box tunnel, which is an extraordinary thing. The first tunnel that long, and it was built completely straight downhill. The West Portal is particularly grand. It's built in a classical style. It's uh, monumental in scale. But its architecture harks back to the Georgian picturesque tradition, creating this wonderful scenic route for gentlemen in their well upholstered carriages. The idea of having such a smooth, comfortable journey all the way to Bristol at that time was extraordinary. And he's the only person, really, even to this day, to have designed a railway system based on human beings. In 1831, when Brunel first travelled by train, rail as a means of moving people was still very much in its infancy. Railways had been used since the 1780s and 90s in mines, really just getting you know, very heavy things a bit further, but without the use of steam locomotives. It's only in the 1800s that you start to see the application of these big, heavy engines that can actually be propelled by their own power. And it's also only in the late 1820s, early 1830s that you start to see passenger railways. For an ambitious young engineer like Brunel, this new technology was rich in possibilities. I think railways were something that Brunel saw as his big opportunity. Uh, this is only two years after Stevenson's rocket, so it's very embryonic. But I think he was very much motivated to realise the potential of railway technology from the first moment that he, that he came across it. Well, Brunel first travelled on the, on the train um, on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in the north of England, and uh, he didn't have a great experience. Um, it was very bumpy, very uncomfortable, uh, which was the experience for most travellers on early railways. Brunel could famously draw a perfect circle. And the way he liked to record how smooth a ride he was on, on a railway or sometimes even a carriage, he'd pull out his pocket notebook and he'd try and draw a circle. And he says that I record this shaking on uh, the Liverpool to Manchester railway. Brunel, with customary self-confidence, was convinced that he could do better. The time is not far off when we shall be able to take our coffee and write whilst going noiselessly and smoothly at, at 45 miles per hour. Let me try. And that led to, you know, him taking on the Great Western Railway and the design of the Great Western Railway. At the heart of Brunel's vision, an improved passenger experience. To achieve it, he needed to push the boundaries of railway travel. He had this idea in his head of a brand new railway system that wasn't going to be like any of the other railways that he'd already seen. Some of the early railways had had very primitive passenger facilities, but when you look at the stations that, that Brunel designed, the passenger comfort was, was really of the utmost, so high quality. The Great Western was a railway built by gentlemen, for gentlemen. They didn't think of third class. There was going to be first class and second class passengers only, and goods. 
His idea was, of course, that the journey should be fast and should be safe and it should be smooth and it should be enjoyable. Brunel's ambitions for a high-speed rail connection were shared by Bristol's merchants. Improved links to London meant more customers and greater profits. In March 1833, Brunel was chosen to survey a route for the new line. He starts the survey and he careers about the countryside by horseback and later in a carriage customised to store 500 cigars, which was affectionately referred to as the flying hearse. Fueled by cigars and coffee, working 20 hours a day, Brunel completes the entire survey in just nine weeks. His proposed Bristol to London route is approved by the GWR's board and he is appointed chief engineer. At just 27, Isambard has assumed control of the largest and most ambitious civil engineering project of its day. The Great Western Railway, the widest gauge and the flattest railway and the fastest railway in the world is a wonderful encapsulation of everything that's good and that's bad about Brunel as an engineer and a project manager. He pushes things through with energy and determination, which must have been quite hard to be with and impossible to go against. This is where you see Brunel grasp the fact that he has his own project that can make his own career. And so the amount of energy and time and effort expended in surveying and planning and engineering is, is quite remarkable. Brunel's a perfectionist. He can only suffer a perfect and well-completed project. As so often in his career, Brunel accepts no compromise. But for those in his employment, the pursuit of perfection comes at a heavy price. Brunel was a difficult man to work for uh, and to work with. I think it was partly because of his own high standards. Brunel himself uh, worked, as we know, um, long hours um, and did everything to the highest standards. Sometimes he couldn't understand why people working for him didn't do the same. That comes across in his diaries and his writings right across his career. Fripp, plain gentlemanly language seems to have no effect upon you. I must try stronger language and stronger methods. You are accursed, lazy, inattentive, apathetic vagabond. And if you continue to neglect my instructions, I will send you about your business. Fripp was the son of a rich Bristol merchant who, who, who had invested in the Great Western. He couldn't sack Fripp, be troubled, but he would basically, he said, I, you know, give you a biffing. He was quite a tough taskmaster for people he thought fell below his standards, but everything was in his grasp and he would do everything he could himself. So here you've got somebody who's got this potent brilliance of creativity and math, so other people around them may not be able to keep up or keep pace with everything that he's communicating. And for Isambard, I wonder whether that created frustration, irritation with other people. Like, why can't you think as quickly as I can? I can compare it to nothing, but the sudden adoption of a language familiar enough to the speaker and in itself simple enough, but unfortunately understood by nobody about him. Every word has to be translated. We've got sketchbooks from throughout Brunel's career. You can see the early sketches from some of these really big projects, so Box Tunnel, for instance, or um, Maidenhead Bridge. But he also goes into incredible detail. So we have small sketches of lampposts from Bristol and Bath stations, for instance, or detailing that you'll see on some of the ironwork still today, actually, in Paddington Station. He's not just designing, you know, the architecture. He's choosing the colours for inside the carriage. And everything's under his control. You know, the, you know, the artistry, the taste, the feel. It's him as well, the whole thing. 
One of my favorite parts of an engineering project is when I see the drawings that I've been working on for months and months turn into the actual construction project. And I was really struck when I saw Isambard sketches and drawings for the box tunnel. So the fact that the people that were constructing it could take these sketches and create this huge structure which, with so much accuracy, I think is an incredible testament to his skills and creativity. But getting the railway up and running meant being more than just a brilliant engineer. I think with any new technology, you need to be a politician in some ways, a lobbyist, someone who's able to get support from Parliament to allow an act of Parliament to get a railway to be built. You need support from the public because a lot of the time, new technologies, especially steam technologies, were often the kinds of things that were opposed as being potentially very dangerous. The idea of travelling at 40 miles an hour um, through a tunnel, all those sorts of things were alien and even frightening to people. And so his undoubted talents as a public speaker, raconteur, as somebody who could convince people, um, came really to the fore. There were a lot of amazing engineers that did a big wide range of projects, like he did. But what he was really good at was bringing people along with him. So even when he had these slightly bonkers ideas, he knew how to sell himself, to sell his idea, to bring politicians and the public along with him to make them believe in him and his vision. The first phase of the line between Paddington and Maidenhead was due to open in May 1838. For over two years, Brunel had single-handedly driven forward every aspect of this vast project. He wasn't a great delegator. But if you don't delegate, it will be on you and all the responsibility will be on your shoulders. And what does that lead to? Anxiety and worry and fear about things going wrong. Isambard's doubts and anxieties crept back. On the eve of the GWR's grand opening, he confided in a trusted colleague. I am nervous, anxious and unhappy. In fact, blue devilish. An infinite number of things crowding in on me, requiring attention and thought, all in arrears, and when I am quite incapable of getting through them, everything seeming to go wrong. We talk of the 30th for opening, and, and now everybody believes it. But me? Brunel's mind must have been completely full. He had to think about pressure from shareholders and from the company itself, because the railway needed to be open to generate income. And then he had the additional pressures of supervising the various contractors along the line who didn't necessarily always build the railway to the way he wanted it to. And then, of course, you had pressure from making sure that the trains actually ran, because, again, when the railway first opened, the locomotives were not of a great quality. You have a man here who has micromanaged, he's been dictatorial, he's paid attention to detail on everything, he's wanted full and total control. Can you imagine the internal pressure he must have felt that if any element goes wrong, it is on him? But Brunel's fears were largely unfounded. Once the entire line was operational, the Great Western Railway proved utterly transformative. It's hard to imagine today the impact that the railway had when it opened in 1841. Prior to the opening of the railway, of course, people travelling across country would have to travel on horse-drawn carriages, on stagecoaches, and it could take several days to get from uh, one end of the country to the other. When the Great Western opened, they could get from London to, to Bristol in, in just over five hours. So the, the world was, was shrunk immediately. It has an impact not just spatially, but on time. At noon in Bristol is very different to noon in London in terms of the official, the local time, um, because it actually is, right? There are actually a few minutes difference um, between those two places. But because the railways meant that you could suddenly travel from Bristol to London within the space of just a few hours rather than it being a few days journey, it meant that for you to have timetables that wouldn't be extremely confusing, you, it made much more sense to standardise when the hour would be and to measure it simply based on Greenwich Mean Time. The success of the GWR made Brunel hot property. And with the country now firmly in the grip of railway mania, 
A slew of similar job opportunities followed. When the railway was finished in 1841, it was seen as um, a huge achievement um, and probably one of the most important railways um, to have been opened. And as a result, it put Brunel in the spotlight and it enabled him to sustain his career because he records in his diary that with the completion of the railway, all sorts of other projects started to be sent his way, such as the Bristol and Exeter Railway, South Devon Railway, um, the Cheltenham Railway and Oxford Railways. So it's, it's a major step forward for him. Brunel could have stuck to a stable and profitable career in railway engineering. But his restless intellect and limitless ambition were not going to let him play it safe. In his mind, Paddington was never Terminus Bristol. It was Terminus New York.